This is like a style study, but backwards. So anyone that knows me IRL knows that my personal all-time favourite artist is Peter Morbacher. If you don't know him, he's the guy who created Angelarium and he also created my love for otherworldly fantasy art. But today we're not going to do a style study. In fact, we're going to do the opposite and start a brand new series called Technique Tryout. Name is still under construction. In this series, we're going to test the painting techniques of some amazing artists and see how it works out for us. While in style studies, we look at the end product and try to learn that style, today we're going to learn the process of these artists and see if it's better than anything we already have in place. If you're excited for this new series, then please remember to give me a big thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, comment down below and all that jazz. But for now, let's jump into our very first technique tryout featuring Peter Morbacher. So I've been watching Peter paint for a while now, both on his channel as well as his workshops and masterclasses on other YouTube channels. But while he does share speed painting videos, there aren't very many videos where he shares the entire process from start to finish. However, there was one particular series on his channel where he showed us every single step in his painting progression, and that was the series where he painted Ross Tran's original character, Nima. This is a five-part video series on his channel, which I'll leave part one in the description below so you can check it out. But having gone through that series several times, I've been able to break his process down into four key steps. No less jokes this time, I promise. All right, let's dive in. Peter often starts with a traditional sketch, i.e. pencils on paper, and then scans it into his Photoshop document. But these sketches aren't super neat with crisp, clean line art, because Peter's art style is fairly realistic. So the initial lines don't usually make it to the end product. Personally, I prefer this because you guys know how much I cannot do line art. So to start off, I have a traditional sketch in my sketchbook. I always start with a bit of concepting in my sketchbook anyway, as my patrons know, to flesh out the costume, proportions, etc. In last week's video, you saw me start a new series of paintings, the Dark Astrology series. Last week we painted Aries the Unheeding. Today we're going to work through the second installation of the series, which is Taurus. Once I have the sketch imported into Photoshop, I'm going to go in and adjust the perspective a little, then lower the opacity of the traditional sketch. I then make a new layer and with a pencil brush preset, quickly put down some lines. Now it might seem like double the effort to first do a traditional sketch and then a digital one over it, but I actually find that drawing on paper helps me think a lot better. Growing up, we're trained to do all our writing and drawing on paper and the repetitive motions of pencil on paper go into our muscle memory, associating themselves with creative thinking. So over time, the act of putting pencil to paper seems to almost force creativity and lateral thinking, kind of like a Pavlovian response. Obviously, this could be replicated with a drawing tablet, but personally, I find that sketching on paper is a lot more organic and instinctive. Now, Taurus is a fixed earth sign, meaning it craves stability and warmth, material security and a home and hearth. So when Taurus goes dark side, it almost enters stubborn, miserly, materialistic territory. A lot of the times Taurian dark traits also include laziness and gluttony, bordering on hedonism. So in order to personify all of that, I settled on a strong, broad guy, sat on a throne of gold and diamonds. He's holding a nearly empty wine glass, cause indulgence, and is sat at the forefront of a settlement, cause he has an insatiable need to create more stability, which he falsely associates with multiple homes. 
I wanted to throw in some bull imagery with the horns and the hooves, as well as a thick neck and shoulders and a wide jaw. Plus, the perspective and tilted head create this sense of superiority. And another little easter egg is that I showed him holding the red cloth. Often humans use a muleta, which is a red cloth on a stick, to try and entice the bull in a bullfight. So here I wanted to give him a sense of power, wherein he's the one holding it. I know I don't usually explain the sketches as much, but this was definitely a crucial step to the process. I then got rid of the traditional sketch that we scanned in and refined the lines to make them a little cleaner. So here's the sketch that we end up with. With all the initial sketching in place, Peter then moves on to render the values. So for those of you who are new to painting, a value is a measure of how dark or light something appears in an image. In my opinion, this is the most important step in any art style, and while a lot of artists are able to go straight in with colour, personally I prefer to put down the values before any colours come in. Now generally, I do a dark cyan and a bright orange to put down the values, but Peter actually makes this even less of a hassle by simply painting in grayscale. So that's what we're going to do today. Not only does the value painting step help us turn that 2D sketch into a 3D form, it also helps us throw in textures, but most important of all, it allows us to determine lighting. And as Peter did in the Nema process, we're going to start by painting in the values as if there were a flat light hitting him head on. We're going to stick to very muted tones, just exploring the planes of his skin, the clothing and all the other elements around him, etc. So as you can tell, we're only looking at shadows and midtones for now, maybe some ambient occlusion. And with that in place, we can then go in and play with some key lights. Now, here's the standard I like to follow. The fewer the key light, the greater the drama. One solid, intense light source will cast unidirectional dramatic light and shadows. Multiple competing light sources tend to flatten out the painting. So for this piece, we're going to work with a single intense light source from the upper right corner. I'm thinking of, say, a sun that is partially hidden by dense clouds. So not only is it going to hit him from the upper right, it's also going to hit the city behind him. Speaking of, here's another trick I lifted from Peter's video, and that is to map paint in the city behind him, because it makes life a lot easier. When you do this, however, please make sure that A, you're using stock photos that are specifically meant to be used with a Creative Commons license, and B, you transform it quite a bit so that it fits the painting and doesn't look like the original anymore. And with that pasted in, I then gave it the same value treatment as the character, going in and adding the ambient and key light in. Now, if you've watched the last couple of style studies, you'll know that the key to selling realism is to have multiple smaller light sources. We want them visible, but not so intense that they compete with the key light. So here we're going to throw in some floating torches. Then again, I did delete these a little later, but you'll see we still have some floating lights, uh, some glowing lights from the city behind him, and maybe even some glow from his clothing and jewelry. So with all the values in place, here's what we have so far. Now, this is the key to Peter Morbacher's painting technique, so listen up. Because we have the values already in place, we can now play with one of Photoshop's most powerful tools, that is, gradient maps. The way a gradient map works is that it takes a gradient and applies it to the value scale of the layers below it. The color on the left is applied to your darkest values and the color on the right is applied to your lightest values and everything in between is applied to all the in-between values. It essentially maps the gradient to your value painting from dark to light. 
and Peter, genius that he is, uses this as an incredibly quick and efficient way to add colour to a grayscale painting. But there is a nuance to it. When you use gradient maps, you want to throw them in as adjustment layers. If you look at the layers panel, you find this half wide diagonal circle icon at the bottom of it. What this does is create a new layer on top of your painting, which allows you to adjust things like brightness, saturation, curves, color balance, etc. It also allows you to mask out the areas where you don't want this adjustment. This is crucial to our process. So we're gonna make a new adjustment layer for our first gradient map. For this painting, I think I wanna work from the outside in. So we're gonna first pick a gradient map for the background areas. So here's the one I chose, then adjusted the colors to better fit what I have in mind. Now, because we want this map on only the background elements, we have to go into the mask and cut out the foreground element. Anything you paint black in a layer mask gets cut out of the layer. So here I'm going to airbrush out the foreground stuff with black on the mask or simply just place the gradient map below all the foreground elements in the layers panel so that the gradient map doesn't apply to those areas. We're going to do the same thing for the rest of the painting using gradient maps and limiting them to certain parts of the composition using masks and clipping masks. We're also going to play around with the blending modes for these gradient maps. I noticed that Peter often uses soft light on these adjustment layers, so that's mainly what I'm using here. But I might also play around with a bunch of the other blending modes. To be honest, this is a very intuitive step in that I couldn't possibly tell you in cut and dry terms how many gradient maps to use, where to localize them and which gradients work best. It's all about the aesthetic that you're going for and the lighting and colors that you have in mind, so definitely use your judgment with this step. But all in all, this is such a time saver. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of this technique so far. <laughs> Not only does it cut painting time in half since we're initially only painting the values, I found that it really helps me explore color palettes a lot more freely. Obviously, there is another step after this, so we're not done quite yet, but as you can clearly tell, this is definitely going into my permanent toolkit. So here's what we have after all the gradient mapping. For our final step today, when we're happy with all the colors, we're going to flatten down all the adjustment layers. You don't have to flatten it, but I specifically do it because I have commitment issues and have to force myself to stick with color schemes so I don't second guess myself. You can keep the layers as separate layers, but I just flatten them out of personal preference. Then we're going to create a new blank layer and start to go in and refine the painting. This is where your artistic prowess comes in, because at this point, the software has done its job and it is now up to us to take this painting to the finish line. So here you'll see me go in with a bunch of different brushes and add in all the little details and clean up some of the hard edges. You'll often see me pick up local color with the eyedropper tool. I have it as a hotkey on my graphics tablet, but in case your tablet doesn't have hotkeys, if you press and hold the Alt key on your keyboard while you're using the brush tool, it'll temporarily switch to the color picker. You guys probably already know this, but it took me an embarrassingly long time to figure this out, so yeah. <laughs> this is usually also where I add in photo textures, especially in the fabric and such. Again, there's loads of textures online, just make sure you use it in a transformative way so that it fits the painting. So things like warping textures around the form and using the right blending mode so they fit the lighting schemes. And finally, I do my usual finishing touches. I won't go into detail here just because you've already watched my finishing tips video. If not, I will link it in the cards. I highly recommend checking it out because I go into detail about all the steps I take to really polish up and finish a painting. So with the refinement step complete, here is the final painting. Of course, you can grab this one as well as all my other video art over on my Patreon. I share the full 8K resolution paintings on there as well as wallpapers and sketchbook pages every single week. So make sure you check that out. Link is in the description.
I'm gonna be honest, this video actually turned out a lot more fun than I thought it would. <laughs> and if you guys enjoy this cool new format as well, then make sure to leave me a thumbs up and comment below letting me know so I know to make more of these. And if Peter actually comes across this video and watches it, I might actually need a day off to cry and be happy and excited about it, so there's that. Anyway, do make sure to subscribe for more videos, check out other tutorials up here, um, comment below any other artists you'd like to see on Technique Tryout, because I learned a lot from this one and I would love to make more of these. But with all of that said, thank you so much for hanging out with me today, I hope you guys have enjoyed it as much as I have, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye!